Sorry to say that uh, the career ladder award uh, has not arrived uh, for the fourth time, and I hope my friends at uh, COG are watching this this evening. And we look forward to receiving that $1,000 award, uh, <laughs> whether or not it's presented in person. So I would just say probably the check is in the mail, uh, and I'll give you a report as soon as I can hear. We expected today and did not receive it. Now that's on the career ladder. Secondly, the high school representatives are here, and uh, we should hear from them, Mr. Chairman. All right. Who's going to speak to us as a high school? First, I'll be All right. Don't forget to identify yourselves for the uh, very large television audience who'll be watching. Okay, I'm Peter Glasser, one of the high school school board representatives. And first of all, this Thursday night at 7 o'clock in the high school auditorium, there will be the annual holiday band concert. And the concert band and chorus and also the jazz improv group will all be performing. Should be a good show. And also, the student council has been planning this year's winter carnival for the high school this past week at our meeting. And we're planning it for the week after our midterm exams. And what this is made up of is the Sunday that begins the week there are activities in the gym, such as an obstacle course and faculty student volleyball games, things like that. And then um, during the week, there are dress-up days and spirit weeks, such as 50s day and punk day, where each day the students dress up in a different theme. And also made up of this, there are contests at both A and B lunches. Um, things like the root beer chug and pizza eating contests were popular last year. So we intend to do those again and think of some more ideas and again those should be in the middle of january right after midterm exams thank you thank you very much is this a, a, a are you disagreeing with what he had to report <laughs> do you have your own individual report um i'm brian wagstaff the second member of the school board representative um first i just want to apologize for the lack of i didn't have any lack of support for my enthusiasm on my my show I was going to put through Cape Teen News. Um, I was all enthusiastic about that, but I had, didn't have a lot of help, so <laughs> I couldn't come through with it. Second of all, before I get into sports, I just want to say that about there are a lot of things going around the 70-minute period thing. And the students been complaining a lot about it, but, you know. What so are they complaining I, about? I just that, like, some people get stuck with the 70-minute study halls, and, you know, and people get and just the lack of some teachers not planning well for the, so they end up fall, falling asleep during, during the classes. Um, but I mean, the lab situation seems to be working fine. It's just that other classes, like I myself don't, I mean, I don't particularly like it because it's too long and teachers don't, you know, aren't really that prepared for it. But. I mean, otherwise, the last. Well, without is, naming names, give us an example. You're you're saying that the the teacher doesn't have <coughs> enough prepared material to fill up the time. Right. So, it, I mean, I can see how it solves the lab problem because you have like a class and then you have a lab. But in a regular in a regular classroom, like in a regular, say, just a regular English class or a math class or any language class. You know, you can only cover, you, the attention span is only so much. And, you know, it comes usually before lunch or it comes after lunch. And you end up going to, you end up, like one of my periods, I go to a class and then I have to go to a 70 minute period before I can go to lunch. So your attention span is, is in, in a sense, less. 
than if you had the seven, lunch and then seventy minute period. But I was just I was just wondering why um, consideration of time would not be put onto lunch during the day, because a lot of people are under just a lot of people are under so much stress that I find that you know everyone's people are lucky if they have a free in the day, because people go into a classroom if they are taking all honors courses they go into a classroom they get loaded away with all sorts of homework and stress and they go to the next classroom the next classroom and lunch is a time when they can just totally escape reality go down have lunch talk with their friends before they go into the swamp of stress again so i just i was wondering i was just I, a lot of people suggested that 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 to me and I was just wondering why it was never considered, or if it was considered. Um, but maybe that's something to think about as you plan ahead for the seven-minute period. Let me just react to that. That was considered, and the high school principal has a faculty committee studying that uh, extended period for uh, hopefully to make it as creative or more creative than it presently is. So our high school principal is on top of that with the committee. <coughs> There's, I believe, is there students working on that as well? I don't, is there know, a faculty on, I don't know who's on the committee. When I discussed it I, with him, I was certain he said a faculty committee. And I'm certain that the students will be involved in some way. I hope they could be, because we have to go to the school. <laughs> um, sp as for sports, the swimming team is undefeated, both boys and girls. Boys team won their relay carnival last on Saturday. Girls won the relay carnival. Basketball team, both boys and girls are one and one. Hockey team is two and two. And looks like it's getting chilly. So morning practices get tough, swimming and practices get tough. And but sports should be well this year. That's about it. Well, wait a minute. Do you have any questions, Peter? Well, I, I uh, wanted to comment uh, on some of the observations you made. And I, I think the superintendent has said that people are working on it. But those are some fairly significant statements that you made and uh, I think uh, we ought to be trying to back them up with uh, some surveys or some informal or formal just to you know find out how much stress there is and how many of the 70 minute periods are um, causing the students and or the teachers to fall asleep and uh, I gather that's being addressed. being addressed at this time. Well, last year at this time, when I was a junior, I was taking all <coughs> honors courses. I, was, I dove, which meant I had to get up at 5.30 every morning to go to practice, have practice in the afternoon. I was taking six periods a day, all honors courses. I'd have homework every night. And I'd have to fit all my homework into my schedule so, and like I'd have to go to bed, try to get to bed early so I could get up 5.30 in the morning to go to practice. And it was just so much stress. And then midterms, midterms are just also stressed out. And I think, I wish that some way midterms wouldn't be weighted, weighted as they were. Like, because there's a lot of pressure on students to do well in their midterms. And I think, I don't know, I'm wondering if maybe there's a possibility that midterms wouldn't be weighted as 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 strong as they're weighted and you know what I mean I don't know how strongly they're weighted but they're weighted I guess they're one-fifth of your grade mm -hmm. and that can that's that's a lot and there's a lot of pressure to study for midterm because I don't know there's, just, there's a lot of pressure in high school well one of the things that uh, is difficult for me as a new board member is that and just having run for the board is that one of the comments that I heard about the high school was that the students were, you know, had extremely full schedules, such as the one that you just outlined. But others were said to be getting off the bus at 1.30 in the afternoon with nothing else to do for the rest of the day. And so I don't know whether there are 100 on this side and 100 on that side and, and uh, another 200 or so in the middle. No, I think the majority of the people play sports. There's a lot of people. There, sure, there's going to be always there's going to be a percentage of those people who just go home with nothing to do. But there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have, you know, all because, I mean, our school is really our school is really academically. I mean, our the students in our school are, are pretty smart. So a lot of people are going to be taking those those honors courses. So they're going to be have that schedule that's rough like that. So 
So majority of the people are going to be going home with their homework and having to fit it in with their sports schedule. But and of course, there's always going to be that percentage that people aren't going to go. Home, people are going to go home with less, you know, with nothing to do. But that's just normal. I'm saying that there's. I'm saying that maybe the 70 minute period, if it were done another way, maybe for next year's, for next year's students, students' sake, seeing it from my point of view now as a senior, when I look back at my junior and sophomore year and realize everything, because I don't have a lot of pressure on me right now, because it's my senior year and I'm just, I'm getting, getting rid of all the, all the stuff that I need to graduate, the credits I need to graduate, but still I have, I'm doing so much. But if I, when I look back to my junior year and see all the pressure that I went through, I realize how a 70-minute period could affect someone with that kind of a schedule. I think Mrs. Bond has a question. Do you think that the students would feel comfortable in, in sharing with their teachers the fact that, that the, they don't feel like the whole 70 minutes is being used to its ultimate purposes and, and that they are getting tired and bored in the last part? I, do you feel like the relationship you have with your teachers is one that you could tell them candidly that and, and, and perhaps that the 70 minutes would be more useful and, and you would get more out of it? Um, I think so. I, it's all, I think it's a, part, it's a big job for a teacher, too, to sit down and plan out <laughs> this, the schedule. But most students, you know, they'll, they'll sit there for like regular 40 minutes and then I can just, like I always look at the clock and, make, and like count the time that goes by after the 40 minutes is up. Do you go to movies? Do I go to movies? Yes. They're usually two hours long. But they're good. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I think. You think maybe you could convey your teachers if, that yeah, if there was if some there way, was some if there was some way that, that the teachers here could could make the class really enthusiastic, right. like a movie, right. I would be more than happy to have a seven, right. maybe a two-hour period. Right. <laughs> but that's just not happening when I'm seeing it in any, all my classes, and it's. I don't want to say it's boring, but I just you know. It's not fair to have us sit through that extra half hour when what they're really doing is that what they're really the teachers are having is their regular 40 minute plan but just extending it for the whole 70 minutes. I, I really appreciate the fact that, that you came and said this and um, I think it's important for us to hear it and I'm really happy that you did. Oh, I'm glad I can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. Mr. Chairman, uh, in addition to uh, our report on sports, uh, I have uh, given the board another report to indicate that it's not only on the uh, athletic field that uh, we win. And I'm certain that the chairman would want to say something about those honors and those young people. Well, first of all, uh, I think Cape Elizabeth uh, High School has uh, received one of the greatest distinctions a high school in America can receive, having one of its students chosen for the Hearst Senate Youth Program, which carries with it a $2,000 scholarship to the student and a week-long internship uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm familiar with those internships. Uh, there are 50, I think, or 100 uh, 104. 104 high school students selected from all across the United States and this year one of those 104 students in the United States is uh, someone from Cape Elizabeth High School. It's an extraordinary uh, distinction and this student has uh, an extraordinary record at Cape Elizabeth High School and if one reads his record there is no surprise as to why he was selected by the Hearst Foundation uh, for this prestigious internship. His name is Joel Pond, and I think we can all take a great deal of pride in what he has accomplished and a great deal of pride in the fact that he goes uh, to our high school. And uh, since genes play a role in all these things, I think that uh, one of our uh, school board members can take a great deal of pride in uh, in what this young man has done. He is the son of our uh, colleague, Loretta Pond, 
And Loretta, I hope you will convey to Joel uh, our congratulations on this achievement. Thank you. The Cape Elizabeth, uh, several Cape Elizabeth students uh, participated in the speech and debate tournament among uh, uh, various high schools. This was held at uh, Brunswick on November uh, uh, 29th. And at Cape Elizabeth scored the greatest uh, number of points. Uh, Bangor was second, Brunswick was third. 250 students from 14 schools participated. And uh, that's a lot of competition, 14 schools. And I would just like to r run down uh, the number of Cape Elizabeth students who did extremely well. Uh, first place in the Lincoln-Douglas debate among the 14 uh, high schools was Cape Elizabeth High School and specifically Lori Rubin. Uh, another first was an extemporaneous foreign issues and uh, that first place was uh, Brian O'Donnell from Cape Elizabeth High School. Another first place was extemp extemporaneous domestic and that first place was Joel Pond, uh, Cape Elizabeth. So uh, we recognize him twice here tonight. Uh, another, another first place was in dramatic interpretation, Alex Metzger from uh, Cape Elizabeth. Ensemble, two people, first place, Angie Gaspar and Kate Greenwood of Cape Elizabeth. We had a second place in storytelling, Peter Freilinger. Uh, a third place in dramatic interpretation, Carissa Missler. A third place in humorous, Todd Erler, and Jessica Lambert was fourth in humorous. So uh, Cape Elizabeth dominated that debate uh, tournament, and uh, it uh, once again uh, uh, demonstrates the distinguished achievement of many, many students at Cape Elizabeth High School. Uh, the competition is real tough at Cape High, and these kids uh, distinguish themselves on a statewide basis all the time, and I. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we want they and their parents to know how proud we are of them. Uh, oh, Peter brings to my attention uh, also first year speaking awards, the awards given to, uh, to kids who uh, are participating uh, for the first time. And uh, Pre Peter Freilinger got, uh, got the award in foreign extemporaneous. Uh, Josh Brassard got it in storytelling and Todd Erler in impromptu. So uh, a fine achievement for all of them. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Superintendent. Well, you may go on if you have more. I'd like to uh, next go on to uh, facility planning. Uh, I'd like to make a few statements tonight as to where we are and uh, what I would uh, recommend to the board at this point. First, uh, we've examined uh, several alternative solutions to our climbing and declining enrollments depending on where it is in the school system. And uh, as we looked at uh, these alternatives, uh, the criteria established was something like this. Uh, the least cost to the Cape Elizabeth taxpayer, the greatest long-term flexibility, so we could watch uh, the demography of the community, uh, a philosophically sound organization uh, keeping children together within reasonable age ranges, adequate classroom space for quality programs, and arranging the middle school so that we could put the essential features of a middle school philosophically together. Specifically, we looked at the implications and the details and consequences of the following plan. One, a move of the eighth graders intermingled into the high school. Uh, I'll comment on these editorially uh, at this point, but we'll give you reports that'll be in depth. I've received more criticism to date on that than enthusiasm. Uh, the conversion of the bus garage to make room for middle school enrollments appears to be very costly. Sending the kindergartner to the high school would only give us four rooms at Pond Cove and removes an intricate grade level from the elementary school. 
Doubling the portables at Pond Cove to bring back the fourth grade presents cafeteria, physical education, and other laboratory problems. We looked at alternative five, which is designed for an elementary extension, grade four through five, placed at the middle school and segregated from the middle school environment. This plan would call for portables similar to the ones at Pond Cove. And it's our feeling at this point with the schedule that we have that we might arrive at that with about 22 and a half stations. Now, uh, some of the board members and some of the faculty are visiting middle schools in the area. And uh, I think we all know that a middle school is far more than just putting the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders together. All too often, uh, those have been smaller junior highs. Also, it's been my desire in these past three years that we put in the essential ingredients of a real middle school, providing we have the space. Now, in addition to this, we looked at all the alternatives in the NESDEC study that was carefully reviewed last year. And I think the administration is prepared to make a firm recommendation to the board, but I would suggest that we have a workshop so I could get some input from the board and the kinds of feelings you have from the citizenry. Uh, well, let me ask you a question, uh, Darrell, because the public is going to be interested in this. Uh, in evaluating these alternatives, what consideration was given to where portables might be located at the middle school? We've examined uh, the places where we think they would go and also how we would like to distribute the, the young people. Uh, the plan that looked the most feasible one was to take the lower portion of the school where the seventh and eighth grade people are present and there's one wing there that lends itself to four excellent portables, very similar to the ones at Pond Cove, and have that section, the middle school, and use the old section for an extension of the elementary school. So the fourth and fifth grade would be an elementary school uh, presently where they are in the old building. The old high school building, the old red brick high school building would be dedicated to fourth and fifth grade, you're saying? Yes. That's where the cafeteria is. Right, and be part of the elementary complex. In other words, uh, we would, I'd like to discuss this with the board, but I would like to see it as an elementary school and be part of the Pond Cove complex. Uh, and the middle school would be a middle school on its own all the way down. It would take some rearranging, but we've, uh, the principal's working on that presently, on how to move offices, how to cut rooms up so that we'd have hopefully 22 and a half stations with four portables, uh, which would be, have a payout at 5.5 month years. In other words, uh, we, would, we, would get state, we would get aid on these portables and they'd be paid for in five years. It's my feeling as I look at the enrollments carefully, in the next three years, I think the board might see more clearly what's going to happen to the town. Thank so. you very much, uh, Darrell. Now, uh, this is something that we would discuss at, at a workshop. Sure, there may be, there'll be some questions here tonight, but beyond that, we'll discuss that at a workshop and then come back at a subsequent meeting to discuss at a school board meeting and take some action on your recommendation. Is that how you see it? That's how I see it. Uh, I think what we ought to do either now or before the end of the meeting, before we get into questions, is set a time for the workshop session because I'm sure there are members of the public that uh, would like to be present at the workshop session, which will lead toward a solution of the facilities crunch in the school department. Uh, would you be prepared to do that in, in January? Yes, uh, the, uh, I'd be prepared to do that the second week in January. The first week is pretty much shot. We just get back, I believe, on the third. Second week, the uh, second Tuesday would be a board meeting. 
And there's two coffees that week also. There's oh, that's a bad week. Tonko well, co we coffee and a, a middle yeah. school coffee. Third week. third week, third week in January, better? Uh, I think the third week uh, would be better, uh, Daryl. So, is that all right with the board? Then, yeah. then the final report at the public board meeting would be in February. February, and, and, and if it's accepted, uh, we'd be perfect for budget. We could budget. Well, why don't you, uh, why don't uh, we set this for uh, the 17th? Is that all right, January 17th? And that would be uh, here at Town Hall. Uh, I don't know. I, I just <coughs> one question. If we can use this room, we'd like to use this room. If not, we'll go upstairs and there'll be some chairs up there where people can sit, watch, and participate. So for members of the public who are interested in where the town is going to go with space in the schools and whether we're going to... Uh, uh, whether we're going to build an extension, whether we're going to use portables, whether we're going to move students from one uh, facility to another. Uh, the night is January 17th, and let's start at 7 p.m. if that's all right. Okay, now let's have any discussion here with respect to Daryl's report. Just one thought, and that is we should look as well as the bus schedule, and that means if the fourth and fifth grade is going to, are going to be considered part of the elementary school, would they be part of the elementary school bus pickup program in the morning and the afternoon. I think that should be, what is that going to do at our transportation system? Are we? we are, we're looking at the bus. We're looking at the administrative implication, okay. uh, the cafeteria implication. We're, we're looking at all of the consequences of our moves. Good. And uh, lastly, and I'm so pleased that this report well, came. Wait, 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 wait a second. Oh, I'm I, sorry. I, I just want to find out if uh, any other members of the board have a comment on the uh, facilities report. Is that right now? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. I'm extremely pleased that the middle school, uh, the ASCD uh, middle school report came out last week. And uh, I, I know it's lengthy, but uh, we've been discussing that along with our principal at the middle school. And uh, the state along with our principal, has done a great deal of work on a middle school concept, per se. And uh, I thought this would be a nice uh, report for you, uh, for, your, for your reading, while we discuss philosophically what we'd like to see in the middle school. And, Mr. Chairman, we have added uh, E, which is a uh, a new item that's been placed on the agenda by the board, I believe, at the last meeting. Yeah, we're, so that uh, members of the public do not have to wait until the end of the meeting to make comments on any matter of their choice. Uh, we invite members of the public to come up to the uh, up to the microphone and introduce themselves and uh, tell us what's on their mind with respect to the Cape Elizabeth Schools and the school department. Anybody, uh, well, we see some uh, young faces out there. I don't know whether Mr. Ray gives extra credit if you come up and uh, make a speech. <laughs> uh, if not, uh, and it appears not, we will uh, proceed, Daryl, with, uh, with the rest of the uh, items. We now move to the regular items, that is the items that we deal with uh, routinely each month, and uh, that includes approval of the minutes of the regular meeting that we held on November 9th. All of the members have been provided with copies of those uh, minutes. Are there any uh, uh, deletions or additions uh, that you want to suggest? If not, and if they appear in order, I'll entertain a motion to accept those minutes. Uh, there's one correction on the name of one of the young men that, that uh, talked to us from the high school. His name is Peter Glasser. Yeah, Peter, we're going to correct your name. Is that all right with you? Okay. Uh, we'll uh, we'll correct uh, the spelling of Peter's name in the minutes, and now I'll entertain a motion to accept them uh, with that change. So moved. 
It's moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by raising the right hand. All opposed. It's approved. Uh, you have you have received the business manager's report. Uh, is there anything in there that you want to ask the business manager about? Is there any highlight, anything, uh, any particular highlight that? Be a full report next month, uh, and somewhere in early February, we'll try to give you budget projections or year-end balances, I should say, for as of June 30th, so we can put that into the budget process. How's our computer doing? Computer, we've uh, expanded the disk. We're having some problems, minor problems, or problems. Uh, some accounts are not posting correctly and stuff like that, payroll stuff. I don't know. It's, it's trying to be resolved, but it's been a week and a half, and we're still having some problems. Sounds pretty standard for a new system. Yeah. Uh, we are starting the budget process with the uh, schools. Should have a package out to them by this uh, Thursday or Friday. Okay. Uh, yes. Did, did we put in the new heating mechanism for the schools so that the heat is more evenly distributed in nope. the buildings? No. Nope. What we've, what's being done, and the report is due to the state the 15th, is we've done that uh, technical analysis report, the uh, program that uh, was approved here last summer. Uh, that addresses that. And what's going to happen if that is approved as a worthwhile project with a payback of about probably four or five years? We'll probably get 50-50 matching funds from the state, or the federal government, I should say, through the state. It's being looked at. It's not been tossed aside. It's something we want, but we're going to try to get some extra bucks in to do that. And we've met with uh, people from CMP the last couple of weeks. We're looking over at our energy bills as you know, what we can do to lower those. They have informed us that there is money out there through these people, that 3% uh, money to do things like that, so we will be going after that. Under the special program revenues, where, where is the Chapter 2 money and the local entitlement money? I see that we've spent it, but uh, that's we haven't in the process it. of coming in. What happens to these, you probably, we'll get the one check probably, uh, Chapter 2 should be in by the next week or two. These we spent, to tell you the truth, in July. That's our computers and stuff, and we order it, and then when we get, the, the funds are approved, we're just not received. Mm -hmm. Uh, local and town is the same thing. The funds will be coming. Okay. Any further questions? If not, we'll move along now to the special items section of the agenda. That is items that are generally not uh, recurring. And the first is the election of the superintendent. It's not that he needs a vote of confidence, but that state <laughs> law requires that every school board during the month of December of each year uh, meet and determine that uh, uh, determine whether they want to elect the superintendent for, for, for the following year. It's, uh, it's kind of an anachronism because uh, the superintendent has a three-year contract with us and so if we fail to elect him tonight he will probably assert all of his contract rights and win. I hate to uh, undermine the vote that way. <laughs> well, well, how many other candidates are there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I'm, he has been campaigning all week for this. <laughs> but uh, if, if there is sentiment on the part of any one member of the board that we should continue to employ this man next year, then I would entertain a motion to do so. Is there? Yes. I do move that we uh, give our superintendent another year of service in our system. All right. A motion has been made to uh, elect the superintendent for another year, and I will inquire as to whether anybody cares to second the motion. I will uh, I'll go out on a limb and second this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got two votes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The motion has been made and uh, seconded. Uh, are there any other nominations? <laughs> if not, uh, all in favor of electing the superintendent, uh, please signify by raising the right hand. All opposed? 
You apparently have it, Daryl. It's my Christmas present. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, the next item is that the Maine School Board Management uh, Association, uh, or Maine School Management Association, which is the school board organization in Augusta. Every, every, every outfit has to have an association, and this is ours. <coughs> and they're going to be pressing for property tax relief uh, with the legislature this w winter and spring. And they like to have uh, people and local school boards designated as a contact person that they can get to a call on the phone and ask to write letters or coordinate local, local efforts. And since Cape Elizabeth's representative to the State House of Representatives is now the minority leader of the House of Representatives, probably Cape Elizabeth's more important than, uh, than it has been in the past in this respect. Is there anybody who, who would like to serve as the uh, contact person? Uh, uh, the same number of people that wanted Daryl's job. <laughs> <laughs> this really is a big political job. I probably haven't described this job in enough uh, in enough uh, yeah, I don't detail. Know exactly. I mean, I read the letter, but what well, all does it involve? Really, I, I think they just want uh, what they will send out uh, to all of the people on their list: action grams. Uh, saying, please get your school board uh, members to call their legislator on the phone and tell them about LD, whatever it's going to be, property tax relief. They'll probably uh, send out a, a, uh, an action gram asking uh, if uh, you'll come up to Augusta to the public hearing and uh, speak in behalf of uh, whatever bill they, they settle on. Uh, I would imagine that's that's what it's all about. I'll be happy to volunteer. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Holt has been elected as the school board contact uh, person for property relief. Will you will you send the association uh, the information on John? Certainly will. Okay. All bills, two thousand five hundred twenty-two <laughs> bills. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the next, and incidentally, uh, it works both ways. Uh, I, I think, John, if you can get a copy of whatever bills, and there'll probably be three or four of them that will be heard uh, by the taxation committee in, in, the, in the legislature, or, or Darrell will get it, ask Darrell to get it, and distribute it to uh, the school board, we might want to get back to you with our comments. Fine. On property tax relief. The uh, the next item is uh, consideration of superintendent's nomination of a special education teacher. The superintendent reports that the school department has been looking for a special education teacher uh, since September, and they are recommending Mr. Thomas Highland. Uh, do you want to uh, address this at all? Only to say that uh, we're pleased that uh, we were able to find Mr. Highland. I just want to indicate that uh, special education people are candidates are very, very hard to find. And I suspect that's going to continue. Why is that? I don't, not certain. Uh, I think, uh, I think there were a large number of directors who, uh, who left their positions in the, this area. York and Cumberland counties this year. Uh, probably it's burnout. I'm not sure. Our director's here. He probably could tell us. Uh, could we call him Mr. Doerr? Uh, are there any uh, indications of, as to why we're having such a difficult time finding special ed people? We're not alone, are we? Thank you. 
Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, is there a motion to accept this nomination? So moved. Second? Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your right hand. It's approved. The uh, next item is the middle school substance abuse policies. You all know we have substance abuse policy in the high school. We do not have a substance abuse policy in the uh, middle school. And so, some of you may have comments on this. Let me just summarize for the people watching on television what this proposed middle school substance abuse policy says. If a student in the middle school is found to be in possession of or under the influence of uh, chemical substances, uh, which includes not only controlled substances, those that are, are controlled by uh, statute with the federal government and the, and the state government, but also non-prescription drugs, or if they're found to be in possession of or under the influence of alcohol during the school day or during any school-sponsored event, then the student will be suspended for five days and the parent, uh, the superintendent or, and the parents or guardians will be notified. Now, the other part of this policy is well, that's what happens if they're under the influence or are found to be in possession. It's up to five days. And that's up to five days. So that means if a student in the middle school is in possession of a can of beer at a school-sponsored event, then that student will be suspended. The question is for how many days up to five days. Now, if a student is found to be selling or furnishing to other students, and presumably this means, while the paragraph doesn't say it, it means selling or furnishing all the things alluded to in the first paragraph, uh, then the student will be suspended, and in this case, up to 10 days. Could be one day, could be five days, could be eight days, could be 10 days. Now, in the first case, Daryl, uh, or so let me just go on. In this case, where they're found to be selling or furnishing, you have double the penalty, and it says, in addition, a hearing will be held at which the student can have an attorney in attendance. And then, in addition, the student may be referred through the school to a certified chemical abuse counselor for assessment. And in this case, the suspension will end when the assessment is scheduled. The student may also be referred to a certified medical practitioner of the parents or guardian's choice. In this case, suspension will end following a meeting between the parents and the principal to discuss the child's visit to the medical practitioner. I have a couple of questions that I'm sure others do as well, but a couple come uh, to mind. First of all, if you commit an offense which may result in a five-day suspension, you don't have the right to a hearing and you don't have the right to have an attorney present. If you commit only when you commit a, an offense which uh, may end up in your suspension for 10 days, do you have the right to a hearing and do you have the right to the attorney, yet in either of those in in those cases, you could have two students, one found uh, to have been in possession of a uh, of a prohibited sub substance, and the other found to be furnishing a prohibited substance to someone, and you could because this is all discretionary in terms of the number of days. It says you have to suspend them, but it doesn't say how long you have to suspend them for. So you might decide in the case of the person found to be uh, in possession that you want to suspend that student for five days. All right. Now the student doesn't have a right, no hearing, no nah, doesn't have any hearing. Then you turn around and you have a student who's furnishing or selling again. You only have to suspend them. You don't have to suspend them for a certain number of days, and you decide to suspend them for one day. Yet, in the road to that one-day suspension, you have the right to the attorney, the right to the hearing. In the road to the five-day suspension, you never had any of those rights. 
seems to me inconsistent. And I, and I tell you, uh, uh, frankly, I, my other observation is a general one. I think you get into a lot of trouble, maybe you know better, uh, when, you, when you give broad discretion to the number of days in which a student will be suspended because then it becomes very subjective and I can tell you that those students will be in saying you only gave this one three days and you're giving me four days. Why? <coughs> How do you draw the distinction between three days and four days? M Mr. Toy, would you approach the, uh, the podium? I suspect you had something to do with the draft of this and you're the expert. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm the expert, but um, some of it was my idea, but I stood on the shoulders of many other people. Um, I think it's good that this is a draft, first of all. Um, what may not be clear is that the first and second paragraphs are both related to items number one and two below. All right. That is not clear. All right. Well, that, that needs to be made clear. Uh, secondly, um, the reason that we have discretion written into both paragraphs one and two, and I'm not sure if this solves anything, but that um, if you look at number one, the suspension ends when the assessment is scheduled. So that's why we say up to five days, because it is possible that, for example, if an assessment is scheduled on that very first day, the suspension is over. But if it takes longer, we do not want the student back in school prior to an assessment being scheduled. Um, I can see, however, that there could be a problem there. Um, we can work on the wording on that. The issue of a hearing um, in administrative procedure within the school itself and in school law, um, students are automatically given a fair hearing on any suspension. They are allowed to tell their side of the story. Uh, they can, and their parents can certainly question whatever decisions are made. Um, so in that sense, a hearing per se is not scheduled, but there is that inconsistency of an additional hearing being presented um, on furnishing in the second paragraph. Well, what's the sec what, when you say additional hearing, you mean there's gonna be two hearings there? No, just on the 10-day um, suspension for the furnishing or selling of uh, controlled substances. Uh, the reason for that, for allowing a hearing specifically, is that it selling or furnishing, we feel, is much more serious. You'll notice that um, it will right away go up to the superintendent's um, and possibly, the, the problem here is possibly um, it will become a police matter. And in that case, um, we felt that some kind of a hearing needed to be explicitly put into the policy. Uh, we may need to talk with our attorneys as far as how the wording, or even if that's something that we need to do um, in terms of um, legal issues. As you see, in that case, when you report it to the police, the students, attorney probably won't want the student to show up at your hearing. I can understand well, that. Yeah. There, uh, there's a policy on the books right here at the present time for any kind of incorrigible behavior. A person gets a superintendent's hearing. Um, this would be classified from our point of view as incorrigible behavior, mm -hmm. you see, whereas the first one is not. It isn't? Well, no, we, we haven't classified it as incorrigible behavior. It would be handled in terms of hearings with the principal and the parent within the school. You see, a can of beer will be handled by the principal. Oh, a can of beer? If we're just talking about the difference between having, possessing a can of beer at the dance mm -hmm. and furnishing the can of beer to your friend. That's the difference here. Right. And It's also a cigarette, isn't it? I mean, if, if all the above, you're saying that if someone smokes a cigarette, that wouldn't well, be... I don't think it covers cigarettes. I didn't see cigarettes well, in no, no, cigarettes are not no, there. It no, cigarettes mm -hmm. are not there. But you, 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 you understand the distinction between the two, uh, the, the two problem things here. Number one, case number one, the five-day suspension, which you say doesn't constitute incorrigible behavior. Let me give you an example. I'm at the dance and I got a beer, okay? 
case number two, which does constitute what you say incorrigible behavior is, I'm at the dance, I have a beer, and I give it to my friend Sam. I think you get into problems with these distinctions. I think you gotta have a policy. I think you gotta think through some of these things. Mr. Toy is married to a very good lawyer. When you go home tonight, you ask her about some of these things. She'll be asleep. <laughs> she'll, uh, and she'll do it for free. <laughs> but, but. I have to have a question. I, this also doesn't speak of first, second, third offense. Or is it the same no matter? No matter? Uh, as far as our policy go, goes, no, it doesn't. Uh, what, would, what would generally happen <laughs> is that um, on a second assessment, which would go to a professional counselor, um, it would be made known to that counselor that this, in fact, is a repeat offense and that there is definitely a problem here. Probably at that point, the counselor would make very different recommendations than they would make, say, on a first offense in terms of experimentation. Probably a second time, there would be a very strong indication from a counselor that this person um, has some serious control problems. It's not merely experimentation. And so the difference uh, would not necessarily be in our policy, but the way a professional counselor or a medical practitioner would react to that case. And that's where I would look for the, for the uh, professional discretion there. In the second, if I may, Mr. Chairman, in the second instance, if it were a second or a third offense, then the superintendent could use the, the expulsion with the board if someone were selling drugs for more than one or two times after a hearing, then the superintendent could recommend to the board the student be expelled. What if there are, uh, go ahead, Jan. Thanks. That was, that partly addresses what I wanted to say. I, I question for students found to be selling or furnishing if a 10-day suspension is, is harsh enough. And also, it says that the, um, the suspension will end when the assessment is scheduled. Who does the follow-through then to make sure that the student does have the assessment and completes whatever program needs to be taken? It's easy to make an appointment. Uh, for your first part of your question, um, a building administrator can only suspend for up to 10 days. Any longer than that requires an action by the superintendent. So this is a building policy, so that's why it's 10 days. Um, the second part of that uh, would be that Cape Elizabeth does have the services of uh, trained drug and alcohol um, counselors. Um, and it would be the responsibility of the school department, really, the, the principal or the guidance counselor or the designee, which in some cases would be the counselor, to make sure that that is indeed followed up. And I'm not sure I'm reading the very last part right about the voluntary referral, but even for selling or furnishing, if, if it's a self-referral, there will be no disciplinary measures taken, is that right? That's correct. And they'll only be encouraged to meet it won't be, why, why is that? I don't understand. Well, if someone turns themselves in, it's, it's very difficult then to take disciplinary action for that because it, it would be, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be encouraging people to turn themselves in. Um, but you, here you have peers and staff members mm -hmm. turning them in, if I read it correctly. Now a teacher sees a, a student selling or furnishing a drug, is that turning, and then reports it, is that turning it in? Turning no, that would, in? that would be different. That would be different. I, 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 see, I see the distinction that you're making. What this is intended to be, and maybe we make, to make clear on that, is that if a staff member is aware that someone is involved in dealing drugs but doesn't have direct knowledge and mentions that, mentions that to me, and I then go to a student and say, here is what I have heard. What do you have to say about that? If the student says, yeah, I've got, I've got a problem. I, I, in fact, haven't been thinking and I have done that. 
I would then probably not suspend the student, but I would very strongly suggest to that student that probably if a student admitted at that point, they're very ready to accept some help. Um, but I can see how, how that, that could be problematic. So if a student came to you or a teacher and said, I think Johnny needs some help, and you took action or the teacher took action and uh, Johnny was willing to be referred to a medical practitioner, that would not be a... Uh, that, that would be not a problem. Suspension. Now, if yeah. the, if the uh, student um, said no, um, there's no problem at all, um, I, there's, I would not be able to do anything about that unless the teacher or whoever it was was willing to say, I saw Johnny do it and I'm willing to put my uh, neck on the line there. And, and at that point, then we would have to make a decision as to what we would have to do about Johnny. Okay, so in the voluntary referral thing, you're talking about something other than a student found to be in possession. Correct. Or a student found to be selling. That's correct. In this case, student didn't bring, may not have brought beer to the dance, the referred student, right? Correct. Just a student with a problem, so it's different than this disciplinary issue. That's right. And I think when you rewrite this, you ought to distinguish it from the disciplinary issue, the rule-breaking issue. Because what you, what you have in mind here with referrals is not necessarily a kid who does anything bad at school. A kid who's just in trouble generally. Generally, a kid may go home every night and, and have substance abuse problems, but not bring the can of beer or the marijuana cigarette to the school, you see. So uh, you've got to distinguish those two and just how you organize it. Sure. And well, I think we really have three, don't we? You have three. We have three. You really should have three Roman, Roman numeral one, two, yeah. and three, I think. That's right. That's right. Okay. Now, do you tell us, is there a problem in the middle school? Is this, this been triggered by something? No, um, essentially the uh, concern was um, raised by a town council member and by the community team. Um, I think it's a valid concern society-wise uh, in terms of the middle school at Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm not aware that we have any students that fall under any of these categories. Um, that doesn't mean it's not there, but I haven't seen it. And certainly it's always best to prepare a policy while you can think about it. Great. Any further? Yes, John. Do we not have a policy in the high school? Yes. yes. Shouldn't this confirm or conform to whatever we have in the high school? Pretty much does. Oh, it does? Yeah. If, we should, if, if, this, if this is what we have in the high school, perhaps we should look at the high school program again. We are. Okay. There's a committee meeting right now to try to really go system-wide from elementary through high school. Uh, and, and we're working on that at this time. I think Chris wanted this expedited because there is no policy at all in the middle school right now. So we're looking at, at uh, taking a hard look at um, K through 12. Is there, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I? Is there a timetable? Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Is there a sort of a timetable when you would hope to have a K through 12 one? Uh, yes, I, I would say probably in the spring. We, we have had one meeting and uh, are putting some material together. We'll probably meet again in January and, and work on it two or three more times. and should have something, I'd say, by March or April. This K thing bothers me a little. <laughs> well, system-wide. How about system-wide? I, I mean, so, so, suppose that uh, some newspaper gets a hold of that, that Cape Elizabeth has a drug abuse policy for kindergartners, you know? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for your help. Uh, as I understand what's going to happen, Mr. Superintendent, uh, the, the principal and you will bring this back right. in new draft. A new say. draft for first reading. That's right. Okay. Why don't you tell us, the next item in the agenda is about the town of Kennebunk, and tell us about your uh, project, your joint project. Right. This is an exploratory project with Kennebunk, Kennebunk Port, and Superintendent uh, Leo Martin. Uh, first, uh, our career ladder concept 
calls for a support team for teachers. Uh, they've been trained along the support lines, coaching, peer coaching, and a host of words that we all use in the educational jargon. Uh, there is a growing amount of literature that supports the fact that the support team action is what makes the teacher grow and become a better teacher. Far more so than money, which I'm very pleased to see. And uh, we're running out of people because we're only 129 people. And we knew at the beginning we would get this difficulty. Secondly, the Kennebunk people have been at this for seven years, and they have probably spent more time on the support side than on the career ladder side. So this would be an opportunity to share our expertise and to get 10, or start with 10, approximately 10 individual teachers to work in the Kennebunk school system as support people. This is not evaluation though. And some of their people coming up here to support on the support team for our people. And that way not only will we share the expertise that they had, they'll get some of the things we've done. And we might build a sort of a, a model where with the two systems we can continue larger support teams because he's going to be running out of people as well. See, that's a small school system, I think approximately our size. Now, I think we could learn a great deal from them. I think some of the board members have been to that community to see some of the things they're doing. And uh, we want to have our first meeting in January to pursue the possibilities. And this is just a rough draft of how it may work. We haven't had our meeting yet. But I wanted to share it with the board because it's for the first time we'd be trying, we'd be collaborating with another school system. And I thought in as much as the president lives there, it's not bad in terms of <laughs> hopefully getting funded money to continue something very important. Since the president's daughter lives here, here. <coughs> it's made a lot of sense, right? Right. <laughs> Who went down to uh, Kenny Brown? Uh, I did. Peter and I both went. Oh, you two went. What did you find out down there? Do they have a career ladder just that's very similar to ours? I think so. I, I, we didn't get into great discussions on their, their setup with this career ladder or, or anything else. But well, we did spend uh, uh, a day at their middle school, which is seventh and eighth grade, and looked at their program, um, sat in on classes, spent some time with their teachers, and, and got a chance at first hand to look at another system. Well, so what do you all think of this uh, idea of uh, the superintendents? Well, certainly the school uh, is a very impressive school. Uh, I think one could uh, take quite a lot of time talking about what uh, John and I and the, uh, the teachers that uh, went along, uh, you know, thought of it. But I don't think necessarily this is the forum. But certainly, in a general way, I would say anything that, that we did with the Kennebunk School uh, I can't think of a better candidate. Uh, it's a very impressive school. There's a great feeling uh, among the teachers. Uh, the, uh, the students seem to be having uh, you know, really a good time, high morale. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly, I was very impressed with it, but uh, so I would heartily endorse uh, exploring this further and see if it, see if it works. Yeah, my, my feeling would be that this is a little general the proposal that you've outlined here and that there ought to be some specific uh, arrangements or specific goals that we have in mind if we're, if we're to share teachers and, and uh, uh, I wanted to wait till we have our first meeting because you see, uh, this was just drawn up very oh, You Sorry. and Leo Martin, you mean? Yes. Yeah, when will that be? January 9th, I believe. Okay, after you have that first meeting, and if you agree with John, you get more specific. Can you also, then you'll also be in a position to tell us whether this is going to cost us anything during the current budget year? Right. Okay. Jan? So, I'm concerned about the, the section that says each volunteer will be paid a stipend. Um, I'm not clear on why, why that's necessary. Uh, I suspect, and I expect we'll be adding to their time. See, I expect that there'll be some Saturday work, some uh, meetings that they'll have to confer, some meetings we'll have together. We may probably spend some time this summer, two or three afternoons. I'm not sure. You see, we haven't had our first meeting. Uh, 
and also we might uh, develop it as a, a pilot project for a grant, you see, and that way we could pay for their time through the grant. I, I'm not sure how or what or why at this point we'd be paying them, but No, but that would have, there'll be specifics on that before oh, we go after in. after our meeting. After our meeting. You see, they may have something in their contract I know nothing about. Yeah. I was handed a, uh, the notes on our visit to Kennebunk, incidentally, and I don't know what the circulation of that was, nor have I read it yet, but uh, it's quite a few pages, so I commend the scribe who did that. Uh, but you, you know, and the other board members that didn't go might want to we read these notes just because they're they give impressions that all of the teachers and board members and administrators had. Great. We should get copies for the entire board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is this just somebody handed me this? Yeah, I think it was just given to you and I. I don't think. You want me to make Chris copies for the board after I read it? Sure. Please. You can actually make copies before you read it. There's no reason to censor <laughs> it for us. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Okay, uh, if there's no more discussion about that issue, uh, is, there, is there any other business that anybody wants to raise at this time about anything? Anything bothering anybody uh, that, you want, that you care to discuss? <laughs> uh, if not, uh, there has been a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations and so I will entertain a motion to do so. Move that we enter negotiation discussion session. The motion has been made to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing collective bargaining negotiations. Is there a second? Sorry. It has been seconded all in favor. Please signify by raising right hand. All opposed? It is a vote. We are in recess. While we go into this hearing, this meeting is in recess while we go into executive session. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was to be dead. He's one of the only employers left to come in. We can't. We can't. I was going to say, we can't with that. <laughs>